Okay, so it's 1.30 p.m. on the dot. Thank you again for all of you who are joining Alton and myself in this conversation. So for all of you who are new to this live series, this is Calling on a Colleague. Don't be afraid to ask your homie for some help. And today my homie is Alton McCall, educator and activist, and I will be introducing you to him formally in just a moment. But first, Today's episode is the second episode of my live series where I had the opportunity of inviting some of my colleagues and healing professionals, educators, advocates, community organizers, and so forth so that we can have a conversation delving into a diverse, diverse topics in mental health. So before we begin, as usual, I'd like to take this time to do a quick land acknowledgement so I want to pay my respect and honor to the spirit of this land for welcoming us and holding us for this conversation. And I also want to honor that I today am residing on the lands of the Lanape and the Wappinger communities. And I also honor them, their presence, and their future. All right. So for accessibility purposes, as you can see on the bottom right hand of your video, this conversation is being brought to you via Zoom and restreamed here on my Facebook Live channel but also on YouTube, where it'll be hosted for future viewing. So feel free to come back. And I want to invite everyone to leave your comments and your questions in the comments section. If you're here on Facebook, it's down below where you see your comments, whether you're on the full screen uh, or the mobile device. And if you're on YouTube, if you look to your farthest right, you can join the conversation there. Don't be afraid to be the first one. Let us know that you're here and keep your comments flowing. As I'm facilitating our conversation, I'll be dipping in and out of the comments. So thank you for your patience as I do it all. <laughs> so thank you all again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We definitely appreciate your presence and for your time this beautiful Sunday morning or well, Sunday afternoon. My name is Kimberly Boyce Lazar, better known and performing under the pseudonym Kamani Mocha Jade. I am an artivist and an educator. I've been working in the nonprofit and education sectors for over 15 years, specializing in social justice work. And I am championing healing and transformative justice. I am also the creator of the New African Artivist Movement. And NAM serves to create space for Black culture through transformative media and dynamic art. Also celebrating fiercely innovative visionaries who collectively occupy the making and the history, the history and the destiny of the African diaspora. And today, as I've shared with you earlier, my specially invited guest, educator, activist, and world traveler, Alton McCall. Thank you for being here, Alton. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I think it's an honor, um, you know, to have uh, people that are passionate in the same space. And, and uh, so, yeah, so thank you for having me. Yeah. So I want to tell people who are passionate and want to know more about who you are in this work, right, this conversation, your background. So Alton is from Fort Myers, Florida. He moved to Tampa to attend college at the University of South Florida. He participated in a study abroad learning service trip to Ghana and became inspired to teach English in Africa. Upon completing his degree in history, Alton was invited to serve as a TEFL teacher, teaching English as a foreign language in Madagascar. During his time as a Peace Corps English teacher in Madagascar, Alton created two girls leading our world camps and opened an English club at his school. Alton also worked alongside the top English teachers in Madagascar to help restructure the English curriculum. His strong desire for teaching led him to apply to Teachers College at Columbia University. Alton holds an unbreakable passion towards creating social justice and believes that education is a viable tool for success that each child is entitled to. So Alton, how did we all, how did both of us meet? We met a few years ago now. Uh, yeah, I believe we met um, at a really creative space. Um, and it was just, I remember um, it was like an art space. Um, I'm not an artist. So if you ask me to, to do any type of art, I, I probably won't be good. But I just wanted to be in the space and be around educators because I think educators, our um, experiences are so diverse. And so I wanted to dive into the to, to, to art education. And so it was, a, it was a unique space. And I think we met 
and I think it's a great opportunity to network. Anytime you you, you recognize people with, with great skills, and and if you've ever seen Kamani, she's you know uh, very easy to network with, and so um, yeah, I think we we connected from there, and um, mm -hmm, I, I think it was a great decision because um, anytime I need you know definitely you need support. Um, um, you need feedback. I think Kamani has been a, a great, a great resource. So, um, yeah. Well, now, thank you, Bobsy. And there's an artist in all of us. You know, talking earlier, you talked about your creative pedagogy and your cultural pedagogy. So we're going to talk more about that later. Um, we met at the Museum of the City of New York. And I don't remember what year it was, but they're still having the exhibit to today. It's actually um, about the history of activism and people who have propelled social change from the 1600s to today. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment, but we've been in conversation ever since. Yes, yes, we have. I, I, I think I even when I remember that 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 um, that exhibit, I think just like when you when you left, I mean, you just saw so much activism, and you saw, I mean, it, it was inspiring. Um, and I remember you had the the hair, and that is just like you know. So, um, but definitely, definitely a uh, good time. I think uh, maybe it was in two thousand eighteen, but I, I definitely. Okay. Um, and if you haven't seen it, it's it's so inspiring. Uh, it really and truly is. And um, yeah, my, my hair is a silent protest. I believe that Black beauty is something that will always be a sign of excellence, a sign of love. It shows the rootedness of our culture and how beautiful that is today as it has been in the past. So thank you for shouting that out. <laughs> but what I want to do is give others an opportunity to check out the exhibit um, that we were both at. So I'm going to share it in the comments on Facebook. And for those of you on YouTube, I'll be sharing it there as well. So please check it out. I know that we're doing, we're um, in the middle of quarantine and we're doing lockdown right now for so many states. But remember that you can do this, uh, join this exhibition online. So go ahead and check that out. Again, I'm putting it in the comment section here on Facebook Live and also on YouTube. All right, so... Alton and I have been talking for quite some time about having this conversation for everyone to hear. And that's because we're thinking about us and our own heritage and really reclaiming our roots and seeing that as healing. So we thought that reclaiming or even imagining the reclamation of us returning home, not only home to our countries of origin or Mama Africa, right, on the continent, but also returning home to ourselves as healing. So that is what brought about this conversation on Sankofa. And we'll talk a little bit more about the concept itself and its origins, but also on history, African-American history, Afro-Caribbean history, African history, um, where we'll dive into the social movements here in the US, but also on um, our ancestry, right? Reconnecting to our ancestors and those in our family tree and our lineage from days gone past. So this is why we're here. Um, so Alton, let's talk more about you. This conversation is about the work you're doing, what you're creating in the community. And I want everyone to hear a little bit more about that. So can you tell me a bit about your mission for the work that you're doing in the community? Yes, yeah, so um, right now I work in the South Bronx. Um, I've taught everything from um, civic engagement to um, history. Um, I'm really big on just empowering uh, students and teaching them that um, their culture matters, who they are matters, and community, the value of community, using your community as a, as a resource. Um, it's been challenging, but it's also been very, very rewarding. Um, so I, I wouldn't be, uh, be doing anything else in the world. I think it's like the most, uh, the, the best job in the world. Um, and I, I really love what I do. I think um, if you really want to create a change, I think it starts with our youth, especially in a city like New York City, where there's just so much opportunity. Um, so many places. I mean, I, I think last year we took a lot of our kids in the South Bronx, we took them to the Met Museum, you know, a resource like that, just taking them, uh, you know, kids that have some of the kids that, you know, haven't really left the Bronx like that to go to Manhattan to go to this and see these great exhibits. Um, I, I think next year we're, we're going to talk, you know, I would love to do something with the African burial ground. Right. There's so many resources in New York. And that's really what I'm about is um, teaching our kids that the resources are out there and giving them access to it. And then um, teaching them that their culture, your culture is rich and it's powerful. 
and using that as as leverage to make you want to succeed because i think the images so many times that we see especially if people, folks of color are just so detrimental to the psyche um and and i think you need really good educators to come in and say no that's not the truth your history matters here's where you came from here here's a beautiful story about your ancestry this is who you are thank you for that i think that a lot of our youth are activated right now they're recognizing their power. We don't have to empower them. They're empowering themselves. And they're able to do this by connecting to their history. They're able to do this by seeing people like yourself who are guiding the way, who are showing them a map to the African burial ground, to the, the Met Museum, the Brooklyn Museum, so that they can see fully the work that their ancestors have done to get us to this place and the work that people are still doing and have been doing over the last decades, for example, you know, the last few decades. So a lot of people are interested in how they too can be more activated in this work, especially with the global uprisings. What can I do? How can I make change politically, but also on the ground, grassroots? So I wanted to ask you, what does activism mean to you? What does it look like for you? Like the everyday activist, how can we all become activated what does it look like to you um activism is i think taking the initiative that's the first step taking the initiative to create change in your community um i think you could have uh, to be honest i think you could have all the people that you can scream and shout all you you know and i, I think drawing awareness to a cause but i think it's taking the steps to create that change right so whether it's community economics whether it's getting into media, whether it's recruiting more teachers from the community, right? It's taking those steps uh, to create to create change. Um, so, for example, you know, I think like, you know, when I walk down 125th Street in Harlem, I've always said this. You know, on one side, you see people outside selling scarves, selling mittens, and it's 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 very cold outside. And on the other side, you see all these huge commercial stores. The people that are on the left side outside selling scarves and mittens are the people that live in the community, right? So as an activist, one step that I could take is I'm going to buy from the people that are selling scarves and mittens because I want to empower them. I want to give them business. It doesn't mean I'm neglecting the other stores who are probably getting most of the business anyways, but that's just one example of tangible things that I can do to empower my community, to take steps towards changing my community. You can get involved in, I think, churches. Churches have always, the Black church in America has always existed and always been a foundation for activism. So you can get involved in churches. We have a lot of communities, uh, community centers, um, different organizations that need the foot soldiers to, 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 uh, to carry out some of the goals. So I just think it's just taking that first step towards creating change. Thank you for that. I know on 125th Street, um, what is that, Little Africa, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing that. They are literally sharing our culture. You'll see the little bags, the tote bags. You'll see the shirts that say, I love Harlem. Mm -hmm. And you have people who are coming from other states, other countries to embrace this culture, right? To buy into this culture. And so that says a lot. They're also doing a little bit to showcase their activism, right? Mm -hmm. Buying from black stores, contributing to our churches. A lot of churches have grab bag opportunities. They're putting fridges out on the corner and they're providing free food and groceries to families who need that right now, especially those who are suffering economic loss right now. So we're really focusing on what it looks like to be a self-determined community. So I thank you for bringing that to the forefront of the conversation. Um, but this activism work, this education work. Oh, shout out to the educators out there. Thank you so much. Because a lot is happening right now in our schools. I know a lot of students are struggling to get to the classroom. A lot of parents are struggling to create classrooms at home. And you're doing that tough work, you know, being at the center of that. So thank you. I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank you personally. Um, and well, also, go ahead, please. No, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, it you know, if you love what you do, the, the, the really the thank you is to the, to a lot of our parents and kids for just sticking with, you know, our system and a, a lot of the, the kids that we, I mean, you hear some of the stories and for them to come in every single day, you know, so the, the real thank you goes to the New York City kids that have went through COVID, experienced COVID and are still every day coming in the classroom, giving it their 100%. Again, I think for educators, we're only facilitators. I can facilitate you on how to empower yourself, but at the end of the day, it's, it's the kids that do the work. And so, um, 
the, the real thank you goes out to, to our, our precious kids. So yeah. Shout out to our future community leaders, our young visionaries in the making. So, you know, a lot of this work happens first at home, right? We're, we're able to provide for our families, what our families are providing for ourselves, and then in our communities, in our schools, in our churches, on our storefronts, you know, at our, in our storefronts, on the corners, that's where the community work happens. That's where the community organizing happens. But then we also extend it to our broader communities, um, countries, interna international spaces, um, again, as we said, our home countries, uh, if we've emigrated to the United States, our families, if we're first gen going back um, or just returning to our original states, if we're transplants, returning to the motherland, if we have that opportunity, right? So you have had that opportunity multiple times. And I believe you first went to Madagascar. Um, Ghana. Ghana was first, but. Oh, Ghana first. As a, as, okay, so tell me a little bit about your time living in Ghana. Uh, so I was only there for a month, but um, you know, one of my one of my good friends, um, you know, we were in college, and college is a very interesting time because you're really trying to you're, you're trying to figure out who you are socially, you're trying to figure out your identity, um, and uh, we we heard about this study abroad trip, and so um, it was going to Ghana, and I was always curious, you know, as as, as, a, as a as a black person growing up in the South um, that loved history. You know, I always thought about, you know, this place, Africa, I know that it's a continent or that at some point I have ancestors. I had watched, I saw Roots. I was inspired by that. I was like, where's my Kunta Kente, right? Um, and so uh, going to Ghana, I remember, uh, to be honest with you, you know, when we landed in Accra, that plane, the first thought that went to my head was, wow, you know what? I could very well be the first ancestor in my lineage to land in Ghana since the, the Atlantic slave, since someone had been kidnapped. The first one to return and I remember just thinking I'm going to do everything I can during this month to really just take in as much as I can because this is a fascinating opportunity um I I loved it I think that it was you know it, it opened my eyes to travel um everything from I mean the food I I, I personally love food food um I it was I mean um yeah it was, it was fantastic um the, the, the kids that we worked at, we worked at with uh, at an orphanage um, and the spirit, you know, I just, a lot of times I felt like there was more care for me than, you know, and, and I guess me being a visitor, I got a lot of visitor treatment, but it was, it was a fascinating experience. Um, I hope to go back. Um, so Ghana is just one of those countries that is just, it, it's amazing. And it, it, it's very vibrant and it's, it's really up and coming. The city of Accra, um, Kumasi, they're, they're really all, they're all up and coming um, and they have their own standards. They don't have to meet American standards, but they have their own standards. They're working towards something. And, and I think that um, it's a, it was a, a beautiful experience. Um, I remember walking through the market one day, you know, I'm walking through the market and I, you, you, you just like, sometimes the way you talk, you know, the way you raise, you just are the way you are. And I'm walking through them. I'm like, Hey, how much are those shoes right there? You know, the way I said it, right. and, and it's like, Oh my gosh, black Americans. You know, and it was just like, you know, like this welcome home. And it was just, I, I, I had never been questioned about, um, you know, like people were like, oh my gosh, I love Tupac. Yeah, you know, we listened to Tupac. I listened to him a lot as a kid and then he got shot, you know, and, and you know, but he, he's still, a, a, but I never like, it was like, you know, like Tupac, you know, um, LeBron James, uh, you know, LeBron James plays for the Miami Heat. You know, I, I live close to Miami. You know, he's a great superstar. I've never met him in person, but, but it was like, yo, LeBron James, you know? There was just this fascination and it was at the time, because at the same time I was in love with, with Ghanaian culture. I'm like, listen, you know, this, this, this culture, you know, so the way that they were, you know, so it was, it was, it was a, a very intimate moment, but I, I really, I really loved it. I love that cultural exchange, this love for one another. Oftentimes we hear about a conflict between Africans who are still back home, or Africans who are native to Africa who've just arrived and African-Americans. And the truth is there is love across the diaspora. And I love that we're reconnecting to that. And that has been your personal experience. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I loved it. I, I mean, I think despite, you know, we could, an uh, individual could have a, 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 you could have, I could be, you know, born in America and have a, you know, individual 
conflict with somebody. I think that's more of an individual thing. But I think, you know, exchanging cultures, no matter where you are in the world, it's beautiful. You know, you could go to Mongolia and you meet someone from, you, you know what I mean? It, it, it's just a natural, I think, a fascination when you come from one part of the world and you bring your experiences to another part of the world and the people there interact with you. I think you're going to have a great outcome. Yeah. Cultural exchange. So tell me about your time working in the Peace Corps in Madagascar. Yeah, so um, I, I went there. I arrived in Madagascar June 10, 2014. I remember um, it being very cold, and I was like, what in the world? It is cold in Madagascar because their winter is actually in our summer. I didn't even know that they had a winter. Right. Um, just, just my own ignorance. But um, I... I, I taught uh, English uh, in a city called Adipunimamu, um, and I, I worked at a, a middle school, and um, I, I mean, I, I loved every second of it. Um, from the moment I got there, I had community. Um, you know, it. I did learn some of the language when I was there. I think... Um, one of the things that, you know, so, so you know, I, I, I look Malagasy, right? I go there, a lot of people would speak to me in Malagasy and assuming that I was Malagasy, but it, it benefited me because I, I think I was able to pick up on the language, you know, like, you know, especially how fast they would speak to me. Um, but again, I think um, I, I can only speak for my community. My community really looked out for me. Um, I remember one time I actually broke my arm and, uh, you know, I had my community kind of um, there um, ready to cook, clean, whatever you need. We, we, you, you broke your arm. We're going to take care of you. That, that love. Um, yeah, it, it was a, a very, uh, a great experience. I think, you know, too, in Madagascar, there is just an openness to collaborate. You know, we talk about activism. Um, we did everything from, I, you know, like resume workshops to the glow camps, um, I, I had a, a, step, a, a step team. I didn't teach them step team, but, you know, I would show them the videos and help them, you know, get it together. But we had, they had a, we had a step team. Um, we did a lot of great things over there. And I think it was just like, there was an openness to collaborate. They didn't let me do stuff on my own. It was like, yo, you're our, you're our teacher from America. Like, we're going to help you. And matter of fact, we're going to connect you with all of these great pieces. And so uh, it went from one amazing project to another. And um, it was it was it was really good. And I just I, I think that um, a part of me will always be there. You know, I, I was only in Ghana for a month. I was in Madagascar for 27 months. Wow. So a part of me is always going to be there. Yeah. You know, I, I always say when you do Peace Corps, that experience is never going to leave you that, you know. So um, I've been back twice since, but I, I um, I'm always going to have, you know, uh, be there. I can't go uh, like a month without thinking about Madagascar. I can't even go a week. It's always going to be there. Uh, but it, I'm blessed because all of my, a lot of my memories are really good. Uh, so I, I think um, they, my only probably bad memory, and it's funny, was when I stepped in. You know, I stepped in some things that I wasn't supposed to step in. But you know, but but aside from that, I, but my experiences with the people are amazing. So um, it was a it was a very a beautiful experience. That's was, awesome to hear. Me. Going. Anybody that interacts with me knows that when I speak about Madagascar, my eyes light up. I love it. Um, beautiful country. So that's amazing. I haven't had the opportunity to return um, to Mama Africa to our home country, any of them. Um, but I think that a lot of us are hoping to get back to the continent. And so I've shared um, the website for Peace Corps if anyone's interested or you know anyone who might be interested. So go ahead and check that out. You heard how it's been an incredible experience for Alton. You said 27 months. Yeah, yeah, uh, your commitment is, but you know what, it's gonna fly by, it really is. I mean, look, think about it. Tw uh, tw 2018 was, you know, just like yesterday, True. it's gonna fly by. Um, so I was there for, for 27 months. Um, that's how long the, the commitment is. I got there June 10th, uh, 2014. I left um, in August, 2016. That's uh, yeah, and it, you know it was it was interesting because a lot of things was happening over in, in America at the time. Um, so, for example, I think when the Charleston, South Carolina, it's a, it's a for you know it, it's an intimate part part of our when the Charleston shooting happened, the church shooting happened. I found out about that uh, days later, like 
it was, uh, you know, I remember I went to the Capitol, I went to the, we have a Peace Corps center, you know, a place where a lot of us go and, and stay. And I got, got the internet. I was just lost for the whole day. And then I came to find out it was like, oh, you know, I, I had found out about it like a week after it actually happened. So, um, I, I, you know, you, you had, I think, you know, um, I, I, you know, you had, you know, Black Lives Matter really taken off. You had a lot, I was in a, in, you know, in a country where I had my own projects and stuff like that going on, but there was a lot of turbulence going on in America too. And I, the, the interesting thing was I was here, I would hear about it, but um, a lot of times I would hear about it from afar. And um, it was at times challenging because, you know, I wanted to, as a, you know, a natural activist, you want to be a part of, you want to, but, um, you know, my, one thing about it, my community really held me down and we, we celebrated Black History Month at my school. Um, and we really talked, had great conversations about, um, you know, what it means to, to, to just be, you know, a dark skinned person on the planet. Um, and, um, you know, so my, my community really supported me. I supported them. So, um, but yeah, 27 months, uh, a long time. And uh, you're gonna miss, things are gonna happen in, in, in America and in, in all over the world, but you're, you're gonna be in that country that you're in and um, you're gonna be focused there. And um, it's, gonna, it's gonna be a, a, a very good experience. Experience, yeah. And you know, that's what healing justice is. It's about creating community and collaboration wherever you go and, and making sure that your work is human-centered, it's healing-centered. So being able to take people in and hold them, not just welcome them, but hold them through their time is important. And that is how those social justice movements happen. There's community in the protest. You know, everyone getting together on the street and walking for miles, you know, sometimes across states in these protests. So wherever you are, wherever your foot touches, make sure that you're finding community, that you're welcoming that into your life. And, you know, for a lot of us, again, who are looking to go back to the continent, to go back to Africa um, and find home and community there, they're looking for the concept of Sankofa itself, Sankofa, mm -hmm. um, which is a Ghanaian philosophy, talks about going back to go forward, right? Mm -hmm. Learning about our roots. And so can you tell us a little bit more about Sankofa and the even the metaphorical symbol of the bird looking backwards or the, the heart, right? The stylized heart. Can you tell us a little bit about all of that? Yeah, so I want to just put a disclaimer. I'm not a historian, um, but I I love to um, read from uh, various historians, and I felt like you know in my trip to Ghana, I, I got to learn from the best. Um, and so, what I gathered yeah, was Sankofa is a is a, a a saying that comes from or practice that comes from West Africa, and it just means in order to um, basically understand to move forward, you have to understand your roots of the past. Um, and so there's this uh, symbol of like, a, if you look up the Google, the, uh, the Sankofa, you'll, you, you'll see a symbol and it's a bird and it looks like the neck is kind of stretching backwards. Um, and I think um, when I was in Ghana, um, I remember just being taught that like going back to, to in order to kind of understand who you are as a person, you have to understand maybe who your ancestors were in, in, in Africa. Um, and kind of learning about your your own past um, and, and who your ancestors were. And that's kind of how you understand who you are and then that's how you are able to propel forward. Right. So what I'm gonna do while I have you all here, can I do that? Oh, I don't think I can. But I would invite everyone to go ahead as Alton said and just do a quick Google search and you'll see these two symbols, a symbol of the bird looking back and collecting an egg, which symbolizes rebirth, right? To go forward or even the heart. And so um, you'll learn a little bit more about St. Kofa. As Alton said, we're all learning, we're all figuring this out. So I invite you to do your Googles, <laughs> do a little research, check out Google Scholar even if you wanna dive deeper. But as I understand it, Sankofa um, loosely translates, the whole concept of Sankofa loosely translates to, it is not taboo to go back and retrieve what you may have forgotten or lost, right? We are not lost, we are remembering. So go back, find your history, find your past, find out who is your, among your heritage and your lineage. Um, so with that, we wanna talk about these years of return 
the year of the return that happened for Ghana last year. And also I want to talk a little bit about the year of return 2020 um, that is happening for Barbados, you know, my, my parents' country um, right now. So can you tell us a little bit about Ghana's year of this return to get started? Um, yeah, I think um, Ghana, you know, in, in uh, so Ghana issued a, um, for, for, for Af people of the African diaspora, a year return to come back. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm not know much about it, but I, I think that there's initiatives to, uh, to, to get people to come and actually stay and, and help ec uh, economically help support Ghana. Um, I think it was in concur with, it was, they did this in addition to what was going on, the social movements that were going on in America. And so Ghana issued this um, notice that if you are of the diaspora, um, they're going to make it much more easier to come back to Ghana um, and um, yeah, perhaps like live, maybe get an education um, and they have programs. But I'm sure if you Google um, Ghana year of return, I'm sure um, it comes up. I actually have a friend who actually went back and he bought some land um, and he, he does like um, uh, things over in, in Ghana. But um, I know that they issued a, a notice uh, for people of the diaspora to come back. And um, yeah, I, I think that's, and Ghana has always been one of those countries that has, when, whenever social movements have happened in America, they've always kind of uh, been a great ally in, in saying like, you know, if you're displeased with wherever you are in the diaspora, wherever in the world, we're open to, um, to, to accepting you. Kind of like how Haiti was too, after Haiti um, gained independence, like, look, if you don't like your experience wherever you are, we have a new nation, you can come here um, and settle, so. Right, and, and Ghana's really led the way for that. So when people think about Africa, they think about Ghana, oftentimes, and Nigeria, Nigeria, let me tell you, they're holding it down out here, right? Um, shout out to Voltron, you know, Issa Rae and her peeps, um, oh. right? Doing great work. Uh, Lovey, Ajaye, and, um, all of the others, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting their names now. Voltron, shout out to them. But also Ghana was a hub for the transatlantic slave trade um, between the 16th and 19th centuries. And so a lot of people want to go back and, and experience what that's like. Um, uh, we know that the, uh, the actual founder of the NAACP, the US-based National Association for the Advancement of Colored People had moved back to Ghana, um, Accra, actually, the capital in Ghana. I mean, this was W.E.B. Uh, e. Bois, And he moved back to Ghana and actually lived there until he died in 1963. So he was only there for two years. So this is something that stands out for a lot of African-Americans as the place to return to. And so in 2018, September 2018 in Washington, DC, Ghana's president, and excuse me if I pronounced this incorrectly, Nana Akufo Addo, he actually declared formally as now Alton is sharing with us now. Um, and he launched the year of the return back to Ghana, um, which was last year in 2019. And it was an opportunity to unite Africans, um, both native to uh, Ghana and across the diaspora, but even beyond here in the United States, so that we could recreate that connection and see what we can do as far as economical gains for the continent and, and Ghana in particular. Um, and so he said specifically, we know the extraordinary achievements and contributions that African-Americans and Africans in the diaspora have made to the lives of, Ameri of the Americas. And it is important that this symbolic year, last year being 400 years later, right, um, that is for the end of the slave trade, we commemorate their existence and their sacrifices. So there's a lot happening to get people back to Ghana and also Africa. Right. And like you said, historically, I mean, Stokely Carmichael is another one. I think he repatriated back to, to, to Ghana as well. Right. So there, there's been quite a few people that, um, that have made that trip. Of course. And so we hear about Marcus Garvey, for example, mm -hmm. um, who was a, a major influence in Jamaica and also here in the U.S. But um, I don't know if anyone's heard of it, so I'm going to share it here. There's an, a festival that happens every year, and it happened last year as well, and it's called Afrochella. So I'm going to share the link for those of us who are just itching to get back um, into the traveling 
experience. And so if you want to check out Afrochella, I'm going to share the link with you now. What did that just do? And um, it's just a fun time to hang out and engage with Africans from across the diaspora and also to get back home yourselves. Give me one second as I pull up the correct link. I accidentally deleted it for myself. And you can find it at afrochella.com. It's not really hard to find if you want to do your own Googles. And in case you're looking for the spelling of that, I'm going to drop it down in the comments. Afrochella Festival. You can see all of the cool photos across our socials and on their website. So afrochella.com. Check that out. You can go ahead and share that on YouTube as well. So we're just really trying to connect everyone with opportunities and resources that you may not already know or have found on your own. But yeah, as I was sharing with everyone, this year, 2020, Vision 2020 for so much of us, so many of us, is actually the year of return for Barbados, which is a Caribbean island. Many people know Barbados for our ambassador, Rihanna. Shout out to Rihanna and her Savage by Fenty, you know, showcase that came out, what was it, a couple of days ago? So I'm going to share with you another website to learn more about Barbados' year of the return. And it's We Gathering Barbados. Uh, let me pull that up for you all. Now, this was also in 2018 where our prime minister, Mia Amor Motley, shout out to Mia Amor Motley, um, during the National Independence Day Parade, she gave a call to the diaspora, those who are from Barbados, either by descent, such as myself, by birth or by choice, um, to recommit to the, the Barbadian values and culture to come out and see what the culture is actually like. Um, and 2020 was declared the year of return. And it's a campaign that's still going on. But of course, we have a lot of challenges with COVID-19. So I do, you know, ask everyone to take some time and allow the country to recover um, before you head out there. But if you are interested, I'm going to go ahead and share the link for We Gathering with you now. A lot of people head to Barbados for crop over. Um, which traditionally celebrates the end of the sugarcane season in Barbados. And it's a six week festival that happens um, the first week of August. So you can go online and see those photos as well. I'm sure you're familiar with um, Rihanna's costumes and everyone's trying to get out there now. So, you know, make sure you take some time to find yourself there. Um, Barbados actually has a visa program right now that's happening and it's inviting people to come out. A lot of challenges are happening right now for undocumented people to find a place called home. Um, and they're welcoming immigrants. They're welcoming people to come out and stay there and live and contribute to the economy. So I want to extend an invitation as well. Um, so yes, did I share the link with you? Yes, you can find it in the comments. We gather in Barbados. You belong. That is their tagline. That says a lot, right? You belong. Uh, a world without borders. That is my vision <sighs> for us, a world without borders. So we wanted to talk a little bit about how the concept of Sankofa is relevant to us today and how we can center that in our now and also in our healing. So Alton wanted to share some of the social movements that we explored at the exhibit, but also that he's explored in his own research. So social movements from now, but also as far back as the 1920s. So Alton, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that's happening? Yeah, I think that, um, and we were just having a conversation, but I think, you know, um, I think there's this connection uh, with just reclaiming blackness. Um, and, and, and so, you know, after the 1920s, 1960s, 1990s, and um, even 2014, there's, there's this, there's a, there's a post um, movement and you know, after this movement, there's just just this era where we just there's this reclaiming blackness. Um, I think um, Kimani and I were just saying. I think hair has always been a thing with black people, but it becomes in the media now as you know a, a priority, a priority to be able to express yourself however you want. Um, a lot of the issues that we see now um, that are on the forefront, I think are are, are 
in are as a result of the movements. These are the post movements, um, and, and they become to the forefront. So I definitely think, and and, and you know, it's it's no different than the nineteen twenties, nineteen sixties, and the nineties, where you have you know usually brutality. You have a revolution. You have people coming out in the streets. You have people protesting. And then after that movement, when things kind of settled down in the media and in newspapers, in black media, right, in black arts, you have this new space where it's about reclaiming blackness, where you're piecing together, you're, 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 you kind of break yourself down, but you're piecing together um, blackness and, and what it means to be, to, to be, to be black. Um, so I, I, I just thought that that was very interesting. And I think that's kind of where we're at now. And I'm excited to see where we go going forward. But can you tell us a little bit about some of the social movements that are happening, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement and um, what's happening now? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think, um, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the Black Lives, I think it's a wide, I think it's a wide front, you know, I, you know, some people try to pinpoint the Black Lives Matter movement as it's, it's, you know, Black people have needs in almost every category, whether it's health, whether it's economics, education, um, we have needs all across the spectrum. And I think that, you know, you know, when we talk about activism, there's a space for you to want to participate. So whether it's you're, 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 you are, you want to identify with the, the, the black femme movement, whether you want to identify with the black health movement, right? Whether you want to the black arts movement, it's, it's there right now and the spaces are becoming available, right? Um, so I, I definitely think, I mean, even um, Black Male Teachers Movement is a new thing that is coming out right now, right? right? On social media, there are new pages popping up where there, you know, the, the call for more Black male teachers in classrooms, that's becoming um, a reality. So I think, you know, I don't, when we, when we talk about, you know, Black Women, I, I, I push back and we say it's just a, a, a one movement towards just one, ultimately it's towards, you know, equality for Black people and have, so Black people can have an equal footing in society. Um, but I think that um, it's, it's, it's wide across the spectrum. And I think that there are spaces all across the spectrum where you could participate and, and you could become active and find an organization towards um, working towards a greater cause. Thank you for that. I wanted to actually share more information about the Black Men Teach movement. And I'm trying to pull up the website. Do you remember exactly what it's called? Um, I believe it's, let me see, a second. I know a lot of people are interested in teaching right now. In fact, um, the Department of Education, the Board of Education is looking oh, for NYCmenteach.org. NYCmenteach.org. Mm -hmm. The Department of Education is looking for substitute teachers. So if you're interested in teaching, you have any experience in teaching, um, please check that out. In fact, I'll share the website for that as well. They're sending out surveys for people who may be qualified. And so I invite those of you who know of anyone who may be interested in supporting our teachers right now. Um, One of my people that I follow, um, a brilliant guy, Chris Emden, he's kind of at the forefront really of, of social justice and activism when it comes to teaching. So if you um, follow him on, on Instagram, Chris Emden, uh, fascinating. Um, fascinating mind so yes he recently wrote a book called what is it um for white folks that teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too and the rest of y'all too mm -hmm. <laughs> so i'm going to share that book with you now i know a lot of people again are looking for resources so but white people who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too and the rest of you too so if you are interested in becoming a teacher or if you are a teacher already um this would be a great text in the hood. I'm typing as I talk. And the rest of y'all too. Um, before you dive into the school system, to check out. All right. Christopher M. I went here and share that with you all. And I apologize if you're watching on YouTube. I know that I'm sharing these links a little slowly for you all as I get them up on Facebook. But as I said before, I will definitely be sharing them on face on YouTube and Facebook as the conversation progresses and even afterwards. So don't worry, you won't be left out. 
uh, there we go. So I've shared his website. Now, did I share New York City Men Teach? Yes, I did. Perfect, perfect. So yeah, thank you for highlighting. There are plenty of social movements happening that have been happening for many years here in the US. Um, maybe in another conversation, we could talk more about them, but I want everyone to take an opportunity to just glance over the resources we are sharing here. And we wanted to talk also more about the African burial ground, which is a great way to reconnect with your ancestors. Again, it's closed right now due to purposes with COVID. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about the African burial ground? Yeah, um, also too, there's a, um, a great resource in New York. I, so I found out about African burial ground through um, an exhibit called Black Gotham. Um, there's a brother that um, runs the Black Gotham Experience and he did a tour of, um, and it was just so inspirational. And then he mentioned the African burial ground and, and I, I ended up going there. Um, but um, I, it's it's in reference to, it's a, it's a, it's where um, there, there are skeletons, there are actual, um, where there were bodies of Africans that were um, brought to, to New York for labor. Um, many of them died um, and they tell the story of um, a lot of these families that, um, ended up dying in this area and they were kind of just buried over and they built the city over it. Uh, and so um, the African burial ground is, is reclaiming this, this, this history, particular to New York and the, some of the first inhabitants who happened to be black um, and, and the work that they did and how, um, you know, how the history was kind of just brushed over. Right. So yeah, as we talk about honoring this land is a traditional land of indigenous people. We also want to acknowledge the many um, enslaved Africans and even the red blacks, right? The black indigenous people that existed on this land before it was um, colonized. And so this is a great opportunity to experience um, the African burial ground is to take advantage of, I don't know, would you call them an organization like Black Gotham who does tours across the city and takes you through um, historical land sites, right? And cultural institutions that you may not on your own think to explore. So I'm gonna share Black Gotham's website here for everyone, definitely check it out. They're doing great work. And um, the African Burial Ground, let's see, let me pull that up for you. So I think back in 1991, as early as 1991, they were trying to erect a federal office tower in lower Manhattan. And as part of the um, National Historic Preservation Act, they had to actually do um, some excavation and make sure that there wasn't anything there that needed to be saved. So in doing so, they found this Negro, what would be now called, um, well, what was then called the Negro's Burial Ground and today honored as the African Burial Ground. So it's like this six acre area um, where it contains, as you said, the skeletal remains of enslaved and free Africans. And that is over 15,000 intact skeletal remains. So they didn't dive too deep. Imagine what they could have found if they went even deeper. So the African burial ground dates back from the middle of the 1630s to 1795. And currently to date, it is the nation's earliest and largest African burial ground rediscovered in the United States. And that's right here in New York City. So you don't have to go too far um, to explore your history. And I would definitely invite people to check out the African burial ground. It's not a large space. Um, I think it's just one floor mm -hmm. and um, it's easily accessible. Let me go ahead and give you all the website so you can check that out, African burial ground. So as we talk about ways to connect to our ancestors, I know Alton, you, you shared with me that you yourself, you and your mom were, were thinking about how to find out who your family um, lineage was. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, you know, I think, you know, when I was a kid, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, my, my older relatives and, and um, you know, they, they gave me a lot of history about who my, who, who, you know, some of my oldest ancestors were. So that, that, that thought was already there, that foundation was already there. Um, I worked with some of my family members um, to just find out basically about who my great grandfather were and, and even before that. Um, I did do a 23andMe test um, and they came back, but um, you know, you got to pay a lot of money, I think. It'll, it'll give, it gives you specific countries. 23andMe is fan, fantastic, but, the, but it, it'll give you countries. But if you really want to find like a specific ethnic group, 
um, I think it's going to be really hard considering too, like, I think, you know, people of the diaspora are so diverse in, in our, you know, genetics that it's going to be really hard to pinpoint you to a certain group. But I find value um, just in, in, in your ancestry, even in, in, in the day, wherever you are, you know, so if you, you're, you got folks in South Carolina, right, there is rich history in South Carolina, right? So talk to your relatives. Um, we found um, the, just the grave sites. A lot of Black people were buried in, in segregated uh, graveyards. And there's records there where you can go and you can, once you know their names, you can find out where they were buried and then um, you can start your research there. So we were able to find um, up until like, I think the 1800s. Um, and then I, I, through conversation in college, I interviewed uh, my great, she, my late aunt Helen. She um, gave me a lot of history about her grandmother was, was born as a slave in Georgia. Um, so a lot of my roots go back to Georgia, Mississippi, um, but it's, 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 you know, while there can be a dark past, there's also a beautiful history. And I'm sure, you know, a lot of my, there was a lot of laughs. There was a lot of prosperity. Um, there was a lot of unity um, and, and, and amongst the struggle. And so it's important to, for me to find out because I wouldn't be here today had it been for them. So it's important for me to dig back and find out how precious that history was. And I have a lot of culture as a result of them. The way that I go to church, the foods that I cook on Sunday, I have certain traditions. I'm going to get ready to clean up after this and play a certain type of music because of my culture that they gave me. So it's important for me to, to, to look back and, and, and reclaim them. And that's the beautiful thing I think about being, um, you know, part of the diaspora. You have your beautiful African experience where you can go there and you know you connect, you know, by default, right? You connect to these people because you look like them. The culture is beautiful, very vibrant, but you also have South Carolina culture too, right? That is beautiful as well. And you connect as, as well to those people too. So I, I think you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, I, I, it's awesome. I, um, I shared with you all earlier that um, my family is from Barbados and we actually make up our, our heritage or my heritage is made up of five different countries. So my mother, shout out to my mom. I see you in the comments, ma. <laughs> my mother that was born and raised in Barbados um, and so were all of her, her mothers um, as far back as we know. And my father, he's the one who kind of mixes things up. My father was raised in Barbados, but he was born in Curacao. And that's where he was raised when he was about 10. And he was raised by a Guyanese mother and a St. Lucian father. And mm -hmm. while I've gone to St. Lucia, I've never gone to Guyana. You know what I mean? Um, I've never been to Curacao. And I'm very curious, never been to Africa. And I'm very curious about my culture, my heritage beyond Barbados. You know, I've been grow going there since I was a child. I studied at the University of the West Indies in Barbados. So I know a bit about the culture, um, but I want to know so much more. Like, who are my ancestors beyond my great grandmother, right? Where do, where do the names go? And we can find out about our roots and, and the culture that we're rooted in by taking these DNA tests. Now, you know, I'll, just to be completely transparent, this, is the chan this channel is all about, this YouTube channel, I'm a little nervous about getting my DNA out, you know what I'm saying? You know, they do a little things with DNA, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? My friend, you know, like I said, he's arresting me in jail right now because of these things, but I don't want to go too deep. Right, and right. see how. Um, yeah, so you have opportunities like 23andMe and also AfricanAncestry.com. So I'm going to share. I couldn't find 23andMe's website. Do you know what it is? So I'll share it with, with the people who are watching. Um, let me give me a second. I think it's just 23andMe. Uh, 3 and yeah, I think it's 23andMe.com. Okay. Um, 23andMe.com. Okay, you can see it, 23andMe.com. Yeah, because I went and looked at 23andMe and Google was showing me everything else. But um, uh, what stands out to me about, what andme.com, what stands out to me about AfricanAncestry.com, um, as you know, they're using the power of DNA to track um, our, back to our culture and our, our, our genealogy. Um, but it, it states that it's the most comprehensive database of indigenous African um, genetic sequences in existence. And it says that African Ancestry is the only company that can trace your ancestry back to a specific present day African country and ethnic group of origin. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, those were the inaudible sounds. <laughs> Okay, of um, country and ethnic group of origin. Uh, 
if the results are from another continent, that information will also be provided. So I would definitely recommend that you all check out AfricanAncestry.com if you're interested in taking the DNA test and also 23andMe. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Yeah, 23andMe. I wasn't sure if this was the right website. But now that we know, I'll go ahead and share that with everyone. And again, on YouTube, please bear with me. I'll make sure to send these websites your way um, after the airing of our conversation. So we've shared a plethora of links of how you can, you know, return back to your home countries, your motherland, the motherlands, how you can use DNA tracing to find out about what countries those are, um, reconnecting through the principle of Sankofa, being able to uh, recognize these symbols and know where they come from, know what they mean. We wanted to share with you additional historical texts and resources. So for me, one book that really um, stood out for me was Octavia Butler, who's an Afrofuturist, the mother of Afrofuturism, as I have to say, um, Octavia Butler's book, Kindred. And the reason why I named this now was because there's a movie called, called Sankofa. And um, the main character actually, um, she, she goes to the, the door of no return and in doing so she gets lost on a tour. And while she's lost, she's transported back to slavery times. And so I'm gonna share with you both. And I say this because Kindred as a book reminds me so much of the movie Sankofa. So these are very great um, aids if you wanna kind of explore the concept itself. Um, so let me pull that up for everyone. So again, the movie is Sankofa and there are trailers on YouTube, but you can also find the trailer and I'm gonna pull it up, where is it now? Give me one second. I would also recommend Homegoing. That was a really good book as well. Yes, if you can pull up the link for us, we can drop that in the comments for our viewers. So the National Museum of African American History and Culture in DC actually shared this movie, which was first um, produced in 1993. Uh, let's see, so I'm gonna share that with you now. Sankofa. Ooh, look at this. Facebook pulled it up for us. You can check that out. And this on the trailer is on the website. But again, you can find that on YouTube. And I'm going to share Octavia Butler's book, Kindred. It's rooted in Afrofuturism. So it has a, it has a sci fi. Well, actually, Sankofa, they're both similar in the concepts. So it's a really great. Um, those are really great texts that you can explore with your youth as well as by yourself if you're interested. All right, I'm going to pull up, although I am here telling you to support Black bookstores, I'm going to pull up the Amazon. Actually, you know, we're going to go to goodreads.com. So you can check it out and read some of the reviews that other readers have shared about the text. And I know that Alton, you talked about Homegoing. Who's Homegoing written by again? I believe her name, I don't want to mispronounce her name, but it's Y-A-S-I, -E Gyasi. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, We're going to put the link in the comments for our viewers. Did you get the link? Uh, yeah, I put it in the Zoom chat. All right, let me go ahead and pull it up online because the Zoom chat's on a different system for me. So let me pull it up here. So I can drop it in the comments. Yes, Yag Yasi, I believe, Homegoing, which is a really popular read right now with a lot of book clubs. So I definitely invite you to check that out too. You can join, um, the Smart Brown Girl Book Club, I know they've read it and they have a syllabus, an easy read syllabus that you can follow along with the text for a deeper dive. Um, homegoing. Thank you all for who are following us in this conversation. I hope that you're taking notes. Uh, okay, so we've got Kindred, Homegoing, the movie Sankofa. Um, let's see. 
Uh, also, I, I came across a YouTube video by June Marissa Caseworth. It's actually a TED Talk. Um, she's a professional artist and wellness consultant, and she talked about what it was like for her to connect with her ancestors. So I'm going to share that with you as an additional resource. Do you have any other books or texts you want to share, Alton? Um, Anything that comes up for you? Yeah, I think, um, you know, if we, you're talking about, you know, I think... Um, I mentioned earlier talking about popular films. Amistad is a really good film. Um, and if you haven't seen Roots, just the first Roots, if you really just want to, I think Roots really breaks down um, the experience of, you know, people that are in the diaspora, particularly in in in, in America, but it, um, the, the, the original Roots by Alex Haley, the book um, is, you know, so you can, I, I would recommend that. Now, Roots is an intense read, so you might be reading that all year for the rest of the year. Oh, yeah. So okay. check out the book, check out the movie. I agree with you. Okay, Roots, I'm going to pull that up for you all. And then, again, if you want to if you want to learn more about the Black Indians, I'll share a text with you in a moment. Let me pull up Roots for you all. I feel like a librarian. You know what I mean? This, this is my social justice work. I'm, I'm sharing... We're teaching right now. We're educating our friends and family who don't already know about this. I know so many of you are already in the know. And so I ask that you share the information that you already have with your community, because a lot of people are always asking for information and resources. And if you have it in you, you know what I'm saying? We're already doing a lot of work out in these streets. You have it in you. Um, please feel free to at least share this video at the very least. Um, yeah, let's let's do this work together, y'all. So I'm sharing a link, a good Goodreads link with you for the book, The Roots. We have Amistad, Amistad up here. And um, yeah, Black Indians, a hidden history. We don't really think about, well, first, Red Blacks again, African Americans or enslaved Africans who and coming across Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, um, American Natives, they had fa they had families together, and they're known as Red Blacks, right? Um, and you hear about the Afro-Indigenous, sometimes we don't hear about the Afro-Indigenous, so Black Indians and Hidden History is, is great to delve in, another, another book that would be great to delve into, and also not just um, free and enslaved Africans, but also Black Indigenous people that also exist, right? So let me go ahead and share some more text. And then of course we have the Maroon Societies, right? So this book is Maroon Societies, Rebel Slave Communities in the Americas, because we was always out here getting free. And when we, wherever we went, we created community. So this is another book to check out. And one last text before we make this a college course. <laughs> is Before the Mayflower, A History of Black America from 1619 to 1964, the classic account of the struggles and triumphs of Black Americans. So this is another popular read that I would invite everyone to add to your library or download. So um, somebody shares a funny meme earlier about a professor who was, he was discouraging his students from downloading illegal copies of textbooks online. And I know how important it is not to pirate text. So I'm going to do the same. You do not want to go to websites like z-library.com. Don't go there. Don't download the books. Just so that you're, you're fully aware, I'm going to share the link now. OK? So um, go ahead. Uh one more, one, I'm, one of the books I'm reading right now is um, The Other Half That Has Never Been Told. So that's a really good one. All right. But yeah, I agree if you don't, you, yeah, these authors, they work a lot. They work really hard for their, for their money. And it's, you know, you want to support them, not um, download. Because um, you're kind of cheating them out of their money, so. Yes, and for those authors who make these books available to students who are struggling financially to buy $300,000 ticks, you know, do what you gotta do, fam. Um, 
but yes, always support the authors. This is this is what we're talking about about building a black economy. Mm -hmm. So you've got the options. You have the options. A lot of people have different means and have different access. So we're just making sure that we provide as much of the access we have um, to our community. All right, so we've given you a plethora of books and resources. The other half that hasn't been told, did you share that? Um, if you drop it directly into the comments, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. Mm. okay. All right, so we are just over an hour in, and as you all know, I like to wrap up with a call to action. And so I'm just gonna share a couple of historical facts for you all, and then we're gonna wrap up. So thank you for holding tight. So this, we have finally made it to October, y'all. I don't really know, as you've seen the memes, it, it just pretty much went from January, February, March, quarantine, December, but um, it is October. We've made it to be our here. And October is a few things. It's Gullah Geechee and Hoodoo Heritage Month. It is also a celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, and it is a time for us to recognize the LGBTQIA community. It is our History Month, and so I just want to share with you a few legacy keepers who are doing great work, doing great work um, to highlight and spotlight the heritage and cultures of each one of these communities. So first, if you go to Geechee Experience, Gullah Geechee on Instagram, they're actually here on Facebook. Let me see if I can pull that up for you. Um, Geechee Experience is a millennial led cultural movement that's focused on educating, entertaining and empowering Gullah Geechee from, multi, from a multi-generational approach. Um, Gullah Geechee people are descendants of Africans, primarily West and Central Africans who were enslaved on Southern plantations, um, primarily South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. So I'm gonna share that link with you now. Gullah Geechee. I know some of you are gonna be curious about the spelling, so I'll write that right down. Check them out. And they're here, Gullah Geechee Nation. Is this it? Uh, I'm not too sure, but I'm gonna throw it in there just in case. No, I'm not, I don't wanna do that because I don't wanna be wrong. Make sure I'm sharing the right information with you all. Gala Gichi. Oh no. There we go. Oh, it is Gala Gichi Nation, I guess. Okay, check that out. I don't think that's the right link, y'all. I'm gonna give y'all I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you Gala <laughs> Yeah, it's Gala Gichi on Instagram and they're here on Facebook, but I don't think I just gave you the right link. Although it would be helpful to have more than one resource to check out. Before I take too much time though, I'm gonna move on and share with you another academic artist and advocate. He is the single instructor at Harvard University teaching Gullah language and that's Sun Um Cha. He's also here on Facebook, Twitter, he has a YouTube channel and he is on Instagram. So I definitely want you to check him out and if you'd like, follow along um, on his journey and see what you can learn from there. So I'll share his website. First, let me give you the Gullah Geechee handle that I mentioned so you can check that out. If they don't stop, okay, there we go. It didn't add it. Why do they keep doing that? That's annoying. Okay, let me give you some check. Some check. Did I put that in here? Oh, it's Sun with two N's. Sun and Cha. So many websites. So you can check them out. And then we also have honoring Hispanic Heritage Month, Dr. Marta Moreno, Morena Vega. Um, she is a respected scholar, producer, activist, educator, author, professor, and Yoruba priestess. And she is the president and founder of Creative Justice Initiative, Inc. And she also established the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diasporic Institute in 1976. I'm going to share her website and also the website for CCC ADI. I'm actually a fellow of CCC ADI, so I'm shout out to them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> okay, so let me pull on pulling that information for you all. Uh, Dr. Marta Morena Vega. So again, shout out to Hispanic Heritage Month. There are a lot of Afro Latinas who 
are now um, reconnecting to their African heritage right. and history. So we do not want to leave our brothers and sisters out of the conversation mm -hmm. by any means. Um, so just again, shouting out another legacy keeper. This is her website. And then there we have CCC ADI that I want you to check out their website, the Caribbean Cultural Center for African Diasporic Institute. Um, the, over the last, well, over the spring, I had the opportunity to take advantage of an innovative cultural advocacy fellowship. And um, I would definitely invite you all to check out the work that they're doing. Let me type this in here really quickly. Hi. <sighs> There we go. So I hope I'm not overwhelming you. <laughs> we share so many resources. But again, this is all about our history, our ancestry, and our healing and reconnecting to our past to go forward um, with St. Copas. I just wanted to make sure that we left you with all that you need to at least get started if you're new on your journey or if you want to deepen what you already know. And lastly, just recognizing LGBTQI History Month, another group that's largely marginalized in the conversation. Um, I want to shout out Robert Jones Jr. He's very popular on Facebook as the son of Baldwin. Um, he is a respect, wait, 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 wrong person. He, um, his work is a tribute to the legendary author, James Baldwin. Um, and he continues to do this work, dismantling the human made structures that oppress the marginalized, um, leading conversations with critical analysis um, that shed light on matters from a black queer perspective. And again, you can find him here on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Robert Jones Jr. He recently released um, a book called The Prophets. So if you're looking for more text, I would recommend that book. He is an excellent, excellent writer and now an author as well. So Son of Baldwin, you can check him out. All right, so Alton, is there anything else you want to share with our viewers who have spent so much time with us already? But yeah, any any final words, any last words? Um, no, I think uh, this was a really good conversation. And I think conversations like this are important. Um, and we've had really good productive conversations. So, um, but I think I just hope we can continue. And I think that's how grassroots starts is people common minds with it with different experiences come together, talk about issues, put them on the table, and then talk about activism. How can we uh, meet our needs and our goals? Um, how can we join community organizations? How can we start those community organizations? And then, um, I don't know, I just have the, I mean, just all these resources. Now I just have the urge to like join a book club. Like I wonder if there's like a, a, a teacher, like a, a male uh, book club or something like that, you know? So I'm like in New York City where we could just come together um, read certain text, you know, so. Um, well, yeah. there is one book, one Bronx, and I can share their, their book club with you. First of all, let me just say the Smart Brown Girl book club is not gender specific, so you can join that as well. It's led by Smart Brown Girls, so all of the um, syllabi are written and created by Black women, and the founder, Julesy, who you can find on YouTube, she is also a Black woman, so she does work from a Black feminist framework, but it is open to all um, uh everyone, black people, brown people, indigenous people, queer people, men, women, non-binary, you know, so you're more than welcome to join. So I'll share that book club and also one book, one, one Bronx, which is also rooted in the South Bronx where we do um, the majority of our work. So um, I'll, I'll share that with you. They're right now reading the new Jim Crow, which mm -hmm. I still keep after six years on listening to right now on Audible, but also reading in text format. So thank nice. you for bringing that up. Yeah, of course. Of course, of course, of course. Um, Smart Brown Girl Book Club. Brown Girl. And Juzi's whole intention was, Brown Girl Book Club, was to take these texts out of the walls of academy and make it accessible to the everyday person. So there's a general track and there's a, a complex theory track. We talked about this before. So I would definitely invite people to look into that. And then I'll share one book, one 
book one Bronx. Um, but yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, that's that's uh, it. But I definitely enjoy being on this uh, this show. I think um, yeah, so yeah, so refreshing. I think especially before you going into the week to have really refreshing conversations and uh, you know the power of healing and and all of the things that we talked about. Going back to you know Sankofa being able to understand who you are. Um, so yeah, I definitely appreciate you for having me on. Thank you for coming. We've been talking for months about having this conversation. So thank you for waiting. And we're going to continue to have great conversations. See yeah, thank you for letting me to expound my passion. I think we all have passions and we, we need platforms to kind of um, let people know who we are. And, you know, and, um, so yeah. And say more Black voices, bringing more Black voices to the table. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you all for joining us. I, again, I want to thank you for helping us co-create communities of collective consciousness and care. I am sharing with you, lastly, One Book, One Bronx, if you are interested in joining a book club. Now, all of these opportunities are available online right now. Well, that's the great thing about going to this virtual space. Everyone can access this globally. So if you have access to a phone, a smartphone, or a computer, um, you can join in on these book clubs. You can take advantage of these resources. Again, you can read these books on Audible so that you're listening to them when you're getting ready, you're driving in your car, or you're just home chillaxing. You know, you don't always have to read the text. I know for me, it's really helpful to be able to do both. Um, so some people read the text while they listen along. So check out these, these books. We really, really do want to invite you to engage your own Sankofa. Um, so Alton, tell the people how they can connect with you if they want to learn more about your projects in Madagascar, your projects now, what that you're doing. Um, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Mr. McCall1963. Uh, that's where you can find me. And I'm, yeah. So I'm pretty vocal on, on Instagram. So come and, come and check me out. All right. So let me go ahead and share that for our viewers. Alton McCall, he is on Instagram, so you can go ahead and check him out there. I'm gonna go ahead and add your information in the comments section on Instagram, at Alton McCall. And of course, again, I am Kamani Mukajade, Kamani Jade for short, and you can find me on all of the socials at Kamani Jade. Go ahead and add that to our conversation as well. And please, 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 if you had to leave early, if you're coming back late, join the conversation on YouTube. You'll find the video hosted there. It'll be up on my Facebook page for about a week or so. And then you'll be able to find it um, on YouTube. So you can check me out at Kamani Mocha Jade. Mm -mm 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 -mm. you again please make sure you share the video like subscribe um yeah i look forward to having more conversations with you all and um if you'd like you can check out our last calling on a colleague conversation with reverend nakenia hall on the psyche spirit work and the six clear senses so i'm going to add that link here and recently i was called to write a bit of spoken word moved by all of the happenings from September 11 to um, Breonna Taylor and us still seeking justice for her and for ourselves. So feel free to check out that video on YouTube. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, um, no, thank you, thank you for everything you do and uh, providing these spaces. And so, um, yeah, at the end of the day, like we said, you're doing the work, you're doing the work and um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing with our children, our youth, our future leaders. Thank you for the work that you're doing across the world. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>